Scientist Book Club discussion. I'm Bob Grant, Editor-in-Chief of The Scientist, and I will be moderating our chat. Before we get into our much anticipated discussion of Brandon Taylor's novel, Real Life, I want to say a few words about The Scientist Social Club. We launched The Social Club um, as a way to kind of enliven our social media presence last summer, um, and we wanted to find new ways to engage with you, our audience. Um, both scientists uh, and, and the science curious public. So we envision the social club as a way to kind of connect with each other in these, in these crazy times um, and really kind of share our thoughts and opinions and, and, and viewpoints. Um, the club can entail conversations that happen on our Facebook group, um, which we'll have a link to later that we'll send out, book, to, book club discussions such as this, and really anything that our, that our imaginations can come up with. So, so please um, make an effort to get over to the social club um, section of our Facebook page um, and, you know, engage in discussions. Let us know what you'd like to see. Let us let us know if you like what, what we're offering, if you don't like what we're offering, et cetera. Um, so following today's uh, chat, we'll be announcing our next book club event, which will happen in August, along with providing a registration link very soon um, so you don't miss out on that one. Um, so for our fourth book club event, we'll be discussing the, the novel Real Life by Brandon Taylor, as I said. Brandon has been gracious uh, to join us and we'll be, we'll be able to ask him questions directly and chat with him. Um, we're glad you've joined us for this discussion and I promise you that you're in for a very special treat. So we would love for this conversation to be interactive. Um, uh, so, so send us your questions at any point during the webinar and we'll address these um, during the Q&A session. To do that, to submit a question or a comment, um, all you have to do is navigate to the Q&A tab um, in your window and click on click on that and let us let us know what your question is. We'll filter those and, and offer those to Brandon as they come in. Um, so we're also going to enable the group chat function um, in this in this particular webinar. So that way you'll be able to perhaps not ask a direct question that you'd like Brandon to answer, but just kind of share thoughts with the fellow audience members, with us at the scientists, with Brandon, et cetera. If, if you're going to engage in that uh, in that kind of interplay, please remember the, our kind of rules of engagement. These are to be kind, um, even if there's disagreements, we can do so kindly and professionally. Stay on topic, so we're discussing this book. This is an a great opportunity that we have to talk to the author of this book. Um, and of course, unsubstantiated claims or things that aren't factual will just be kind of disregarded. So. We're giving this chat function a try during this webinar. If for any reason it feels like it's going off the rails, we're just going to disable it. So in the interest of kind of like, you know, trying this out and giving it a fair shake, please just kind of adhere to those rules and be be nice. <laughs> um, so the video for this webinar will be archived on the scientist website and we'll send all attendees a link to that email within a couple of days. So with that, let me introduce our speaker, Brandon Taylor. And he will be oh, that you. was that was the cue. Okay, I thought I was gonna wait till after the the bio, but I'm here. Exciting! No, there we go. There's Brandon Taylor joining us from Iowa City, Iowa. Um, so I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about Brandon to set up our conversation. Um, Brandon studied uh, biochemistry at the University of Wisconsin Madison. Um, he was an Iowa Arts Fellow at the prestigious Iowa Writers Workshop. His debut novel, Real Life, was a New York Times editor's choice and shortlisted for the 2020 Booker Prize, as well as the National Book Critics Circle John Leonard Prize and the 2021 Young Lions Fiction Award. So before we dive into the q and I want to remind the audience that you may ask questions again at any time using that Q&A tab, um, and you can also chat using that chat tab. Um, we've already gotten some great questions. I thought that I thought that the best thing to do, Brandon, if this is okay, would be to give uh, readers or, or, or audience members who don't know about your personal kind of history and how that might link up with the, with the book and the writing of the book, just to give them a flavor of kind of like where how this how this book came about, how it kind of relates to your own experience. Sure. Yeah. So the novel came about while I was working in a research lab while I was a PhD student at uh, UW Madison. And, you know, once I decided to write a novel, which I only did because an agent at the time was sort of pressuring me to, I just, you know, I asked myself like, what, what do I know enough about to, 
to write a novel about. And really what I came, the conclusion I came to was that the only thing that I knew enough about was the life of a research scientist and an academic and a graduate student in the sciences. Um, and pretty quickly the story of you know, one of those perfect late summer weekends when you're in grad school, <laughs> um, that that very quickly came to seem like the most interesting and, and urgent story I, I could try to write about. Um, but as for my life then, I mean, I was working in a lab all day, every day. I was trying to get a PhD. I was studying stem cell fate decisions and, and nematodes. And I had spent my entire life thinking I was going to be a scientist and working really diligently toward that. Um, but, you know, <laughs> as it will do, graduate education in the sciences causes one to question one's life decisions. And, <laughs> and you know, when I was late into my grad program, I started wondering if maybe I was meant for something else, not better or worse, just different. And since I'd been writing my whole life as well, it, it seemed like a like a possible lateral transition for myself. So I applied to the writer's workshop and two things happened at the same time, which is that my thesis research kind of imploded and I got into Iowa and it just made sense to, <laughs> you know, like it made sense to, it seemed like the universe was, telling me that I needed to make a, a different choice about my life. So I did, I went to Iowa and did that for two years. And then last year, this book came out. Excellent. So I think um, Brandon has again, graciously agreed to read a, a brief passage from the book. Um, I think that'd be great. And then we can get into um, get into some of the specific questions about the book. So yeah, Brandon, take it away. <laughs> Exciting, yeah. So I'm just going to read from the very, the very opening pages of the novel, and you don't need to know much except that it's about a young man, Wallace, who is a research student in biochemistry in an unnamed Midwestern college town on Three Lakes, <laughs> which, if you've been to Madison, Wisconsin, tells you everything you need to know. <clears throat> it was a cool evening in late summer when Wallace, his father dead for several weeks, decided that he would meet his friends at the pier after all. The lake was dimpled with white waves. People coveted these last blustery days of summer before the weather turned cold and mercurial. The air was heavy with their good times as the white people scattered across the tiered patios, pried their mouths apart and beamed their laughter into each other's faces. Overhead, gulls drifted easy as anything. Wallace stood on an upper platform looking down into the scrum trying to find his particular group of white people thinking also that it was still possible to turn back that he could go home and get on with his evening it had been a couple of years since he had gone to the lake with his friends a period of time that embarrassed him because it seemed to demand an excuse and he did not have one it might have had something to do with the crowd Clouds, the insistence of other people's bodies, the way the birds circled overhead, then dive on the tables to grab food or root around at their feet as though even they were socializing. Threats from every corner. There was also the matter of the noise, the desperate braying of everyone talking over everyone else, the bad music, the children and dogs, the radios from the frats down the lake shore, the car stereos in the streets, the shouting mass of hundreds of lives disagreeing. The noise demanded vague and strange things from Wallace. And I'll stop there. Excellent. Very nice. <laughs> okay. um, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you the first question um, because I get to. <laughs> um, it seems to me that in spots, Wallace had, I think for lack of a better word, almost like a disdain for science. Mm. Um, it, it, one, one section in particular stood out to me, and, and I'll just read a, a, little, a little passage from it. Um, let's see where, yeah. So that his gradients are clearer, sharper even than Katie's does not reflect a superiority on his part, a greater mind, for example, so much as it demonstrates that Wallace has the time to burn, time for the idle stupidity it takes to sit in front of a scope and wait for hours. So to me, that really said, like, even though he was engaged in the scientific process, he had this kind of disdain for it. Is that, is that something that you think was important to hit the arc of his kind of uh, uh, evolution in the story? 
um, and his kind of progress through through that crucible that is that is a uh, you know scientific grad school. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, I think that every I think that every person who spends ten hours in front of a microscope has their moments where they're just like, "What is the point of this? Like, why am I staring into the scope for ten hours a day, like, ruining my neck and my back? Like, what is this all for?" Um, I think that there there are certain points in in science where the mundane aspect of it, the sort of mundane repetition becomes the dominant character of, of what it is you're doing and you lose sight of, you know, like you lose sight of the why of it all. You, you lose sight of the, the sort of grand project of trying to understand the world or the, or the nature of existence in a deeper, more interesting way. Like all the sort of grand aspects of science go away when you're just like pipetting for <laughs> for days on end. Um, and it, it felt important to capture that, you know, it, it felt true to the experience because there are some days when you feel like I, I am doing something worthwhile and I totally understand the why, the so what factor, like I know why I'm doing this and I, I can see the beauty in it. And there are some days when you can't, <laughs> you know, like there are some days when you're just like, I've done the same experiment 10 times and I have no idea why my PCR won't work. Like, why won't this, why won't this work? And, and both of those things are true of, you know, the endeavor of science. It is at once like soul crushing in its mundanity. And it is also really sweeping and beautiful and moving. And I think as a scientist, you're, you're, you're always sort of caught between those two polarities being kicked, you know, up and down. Mm -hmm. um, some days you're up and some days you're down and some days that you feel like you're doing the Lord's work and some days you feel like you're mucking the stalls. Yeah. And, and, and I'm curious, what do you, in your opinion, what does, what does a trainee scientist? So, so a lot of the book was, fo or some of the book was focused on Wallace's relationship with Simone and kind of that mm -hmm. advisor advisee relationship. So in terms of communicating the broader picture of science and the, and the, and the, you know, maybe engendering some more of those days where you, where a trainee feels like he or she is doing the Lord's work. Do you think that the advisor has a role in that? Like, do you think some advisors are better at communicating and making that part of science real and some maybe aren't? Yeah, I, I do. I mean, I think that if you, ha I mean, you know, when I was in grad school, some of my, some of my friends had advisors who were these like almost oracular even, you know, e great evangelicals for science who convinced people to join their lab by, by being these kind of like sweeping orators for science. Mm -hmm. um, and then there were advisors who were not so good at that. Advisors who were much more, you know, you need to clock in at seven, clock out at eight, you need to do this amount of work and get this done X, Y, and Z. And I think it, every advisor has their own way of motivating students and every advisor has their own strengths and weaknesses along those lines. But I do think that when trainees are struggling with motivation, one of the things that a great advisor does is locates that student's specific needs. Like what would motivate that student would make them feel like they're doing something worthwhile and can, activate them in ways that are productive and healthy and 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 so on and i think one of the you know one of the worst <laughs> things to experience as a trainee is a disconnect where your advisor thinks that they're being motivational but what they're doing is being kind of tyrannical and and they're not helping you as an individual they're just sort of doing what they always do for everybody and not you know sort of personalizing that motivation and you know for some people a sort of great sweeping orator is great and for some people that person is woo woo and like they they're they're idealistic and disconnected and you know i think like in all things science is a conversation and you know an advisee advisor relationship requires i think and like it requires communication and, and as such it can be it can go awry and all the ways that we know communication can and often does. Yeah, which which kind of makes me think of the characters in the book and all the problems with communication that, mm -hmm. that they had. But but for, before we get into that, let me ask you, so making the transition from the scientific enterprise into writing, have you found kind of correlates where it's like, because 
to me, every kind of everything that produces something worthwhile or, you know, that, that contributes, let's say, to society, science, literature, art, whatever, there's lots of there's lots of work going on in the background that people who are consumers of that product aren't necessarily aware of. So in, in science, it's the pipetting, it's the endless staring into a microscope. Mm -hmm. Uh, with writing, it might be the hard the hard work of actually writing. Have you found correlates between like cr like um, putting your putting yourself in a position where you can kind of understand the broad sweep of what you're doing while kind of managing, or, or are you running into some of the same same difficulties that that Wallace did in the book? Yeah, I mean, I think part of this has to do with my nature, which is that to me, science and art have always been very much similar enterprises and they felt the same to me and mm -hmm. and so just moving from science into writing and into art like it, it it didn't feel like that big like it felt like a transition in the particularities of it like the day-to-day -day, the sort of granular mechanics of it were different but the sort of broad scope were very much similar um and so i i mean there have been many correlates i do think that like as a you know, in some of my early interviews for this book, I, you know, I often said like, you know, writing and science, the same thing, because you're by yourself, you're doing this repetitive, horrifying thing <laughs> over and over for years and years and years, and you have no idea if it has worked until you reach the end. And then if it hasn't worked, it could be for any number of reasons that you have to diagnose, <laughs> and then you have to do it over again. And then you spend all this time hopefully reaching some sort of new understanding of the world and the way that we relate to it. And then you send it out into the world and people judge it. Like it's, it's the same thing. It is the, it is the same. It's to me, it's the same feeling. And, you know, I mean, making the transition from science grad school to writing grad school, you know, it felt very similar as well. I, I'm starting to think that any enterprise where you have high achieving self-selected people, like trying to learn how to do the thing that they want to dedicate their life to. I, I'm getting the feeling that it's all kind of the same underlying <laughs> set of sensations somehow. Yeah. Well, continue on with the correlates because one one of the things um, that, that struck any reader of the book were as Wallace progressed in this kind of crucible of, of, of grad school, there were, you know, aggressions, microaggressions, some hmm. macroaggressions, racism, homophobia. Have it, it, So I, I want to be careful not to extrapolate too much because this is a work of fiction, but clearly it's kind of like based on your own experiences. As, as you went from science to writing, did some of those aggressions or all of them kind of migrate with you? Um, and, are, and, and, and how are you navigating that as you kind of progress in your, in your career as a writer? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, some of them did not because some of the some of the difficulties of being like a queer black PhD student in sciences are like very much like rooted in the specificity of being in science and like science mm -hmm. academia is like a very strange it's a very strange enterprise like the structure of it is very weird um and so moving from this like very regimented very hierarchical like pedagogical experience in science into the more like woo woo no one tells you what to do <laughs> grades don't matter like the sort of non-hierarchical but hierarchical and stranger more subtle ways of like an mfa program like that was quite different and i did find myself encountering similar similar tensions this idea that Sometimes when I would say things in my PhD program, people would act as though I didn't know what I was talking about. There was not this presumption of my expertise, even on things where I clearly had the expertise in the room. And that was very similar in my MFA program where I would say things or, or, or try to articulate thoughts about art. And there was this presupposition that I had no expertise, even if I did have an expertise like having worked as a literary editor for many years and having written multiple manuscripts and having sort of done all this research into the ways that publishing and writing worked, there was still this presupposition that I didn't know what I was talking about, even when people were sort of judging my art. Um, and it's strange that in science, when I would do like a lab proposal, there was no presupposition that my data 
you know, weren't correct. There was no presupposition that my that my work was bad, just that I, <laughs> as a person, when talking about life, didn't know what I was talking about. But in my MFA mm -hmm. program, there was a dual presupposition that not only was my work bad and I didn't know what I was doing there, but also in life, I had no expertise. And some of that feels uh, racialized and classed <laughs> for variety reasons. And some of that does feel particular to certain strains of elitism in literary spaces. Um, so, you know, take the good with the bad, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'd like to ask a question about the title of the book. And, and the phrase mm -hmm. real life comes up um, a few times in the dialogue between the between the grad students. And I mean, it's, it's pretty clear that they view the world outside of the lab as real life. Mm -hmm. um, can you can you talk just a little bit about that and why it was important to make that distinction, um, especially in your experience as you know grad student in both realms? And I, I don't know, maybe maybe you're in real life now. <laughs> maybe maybe you don't feel as though you have uh, entered <laughs> entered real life yet. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I uh, I have this very millennial sensation of like my life not really counting yet until I get out into the grown up space. Um, though I am very rapidly approaching the age of 32 and I am a grown up, I don't feel like it until I, you know, have a mortgage and like all the trappings of, I, I you know, I think that in the, in the context of the novel, in academia, there is this idea that if you are in academia, that is just training. That is just like you're preparing for like, like your actual life. And that quote unquote real life is like all the stuff out there. And I also think that there's this prevailing ethic in American society that like bourgeois life is not real life. And that work class life is quote unquote cap real with a capital R life. And I think a lot of that trickles into academia. And so the characters in the novel being graduate students and feeling very much like students, they, they think that everything that is not within this very carefully prescribed world of academia is like a simulation or a test run for actual life. Um, and you know, they they have friends who live in that world of like a nine to five job and like nobody tells them what seminars to go to. And those characters judge them for being very privileged and living inside of, of a prescribed world with all these presumed safety nets. But then you have someone like Wallace who, <laughs> who like has no safety nets and who was trying to figure out what is real life? And is it precarity that makes a life real? And if so, Wallace is someone who experiences a great deal of precarity. This is no fun time simulation for him. It's like real, there are real stakes for him. And I think one of the things that the book plots is his growing awareness that the, the stakes for him, even in academia, are so much higher than the stakes for the people around him. And he's realizing that like, he thought he was attaining a level of distance from precarity and a, a level of safety. And what he realizes is that like, oh no, actually <laughs> I'm still very much in danger. And like, <laughs> this is for real. This is not fake for me. This is not a game. This is horrifying. If I fail out of this program, I'll, I'll have nothing. I'll, I have no money. I have no family. I have nothing to return to. So, you know, you know, it, it's it's a tension that I think runs through the book is different is always changing. I think. Yeah, and I I think if 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 I had to boil down that tension into one word, and, and especially what you're talking about with Wallace and his view of kind of his path, mm. it would be fear, right? So I'm I'm curious, did did the, did that fear also, we, you talked before about communication kind of breakdowns, and it seems to me like the characters in the book are presented with several opportunities to talk about real things when when Wallace and, and Miller kind of divulge their past uh, mm -hmm. to each other, when they, when they you know, when, as their relationship takes shape, they, all, they have these several opportunities to talk about that and talk about the real things that are happening to them and the real emotions they're feeling, and they always choose to push it away. They always choose to push it away, like almost as if it's like too real to talk about. 
can you talk about that kind of how you engineered that kind of feeling mm. in the book of like keeping keeping real life at bay in a way through the through the dialogue between the between the characters? Yeah, I mean that was one of the places where my editor was most helpful because there were various form there were various drafts of those conversations that the characters have in the book, and my editor was always encouraging me to to let the characters be kind of inarticulate about the things that are hardest for them to discuss. You know, I think there's this impulse as a writer to want to be able to, you think good dialogue looks like characters sort of revealing their truths in these like very eloquent soliloquies or monologues or, or whatever. And what I have found in like real life is that you know, the stuff that we most want to say is sometimes the stuff that we are are least articulate about. And it sort of comes out in these like mumbled bursts of like seemingly unrelated chatter. And my editor was really helpful in in finding the naturalism in that and finding the sort of natural and articulate bumbling cadences. Because what what is true for the characters in the book is that their way of surviving all the stress and the tension of their lives is by excluding things that make conversations difficult. By excluding all that stuff, they're able to just like have these very pleasant, easy bantery conversations. They can crack all these jokes, but the minute that anything that would disrupt that rhythm is introduced, you know, suddenly it's this existential threat. And I think that comes to a head in that scene in, in the fourth section of the dinner party where race, makes an appearance in the conversation and there's no way to elide, right? There's no way to like turn that into a joke. There's no way to metabolize that within the natural social rhythms of that scene without it shredding everything in its path. And so mm -hmm. what they do is they ignore it. <laughs> they like, they're like, oh, can't process this. Let's just wait for a, a set amount of time to pass and then change the subject. Let's move on. Let's not talk about the difficult things. Yeah. Um, and so I think it's very much like a social survival mechanism that people employ in actual life. And, and so getting it on the page was just a matter of like writing those scenes and reworking them and reworking them and, and trying to get the inarticulate the inarticulate on the page and and letting characters be awkward in their dialogue was you know as as someone who likes pristine dialogue it was difficult to let them be awkward and to let them bumble their way through social situations mm, for sure um so we have a couple uh questions that have come in from readers um that i'd like to get to this is an unnamed reader but we'll allow anonymity <laughs> <laughs> um, this reader asks, uh, what has the reaction been like from the scientific community or from PhD students uh, more specifically themselves? Yeah, I mean, so when I wrote this book, I thought, I thought no scientist would read it because when I was in academia, when I was in science, scientists were not reading books. Like no one was, re they were not reading novels. There were no social clubs back in my day, I'll have you know. <laughs> um, and, and so I thought I was writing a book that maybe three people in the world were going to read. And instead, when it published, I felt like I was sort of launched out in front of the world and everyone's like, whoa, that's what scientists are doing? Um, and so I anticipated a fair amount of like backlash or discomfort, because it's a really uncomfortable, it's not a flattering look at academia at all. But what I found was that people, people were so generous and they were so receptive to this book and, um, I went, my last in-person book event was in Madison, Wisconsin. And I, so I got to take the book home in, in some sense. And I thought it was just going to be my writing friends there, like three people from the whole city. But instead, the room at A Room One's Own, it was full. The bookstore was like full from like the podium all the way back through the front of the store. And it was packed with people from the PhD programs in science on campus. And they had, they came out and they were so generous and they were so wonderful. And my lab mates came out and they were so, I mean, they, and then my, I went out to dinner with my lab mates and I thought that was gonna be a very tense dinner, but they were, they just, they, they were so lovely and so wonderful. And they, 
they understood so much about the book that I hope they would. And so it, it, it's been really amazing to see the book become a part of, I think some really hard won, very important conversations about equity and diversity in STEM, mm -hmm. um, about black and STEM, about, you know, being black in academia, you know, it, it's been really, I mean, I just feel honored that people have brought the book into those conversations. And it's been, you know, I've been amazed. <laughs> I've been amazed and really humbled by, by the reception. And I think it's, you know, every writer's dream that your people, the science nerds of the world, uh, read the book and felt that they and felt seen and felt that something true about their experience had been articulated. It, yeah, it was, it's been really fantastic from my end. Um, I yeah. can't speak to the PIs of the world though, <laughs> I mean. <laughs> Well, yeah, let's let's talk about that because you you just said that that it kind of engendered these conversations or at least brought brought a, a, an experience that people might not have been, been aware of, been had access to mm. to that conversation about equity and kind of just the graduate experience and especially if you're not kind of like the dominant part part of the dominant culture and and what the experience is in in graduate school. What in terms of your opinion, what where do you think we go from here? I mean, I, I understand, I'm not asking you to kind of like solve all the problems right now on this call, but how do you think we can best approach making things better, making things more equitable, making things more, um, you know, constructive for, mm -hmm. for graduate students of all types? Yeah. I mean, one, I will say that one thing that I, that I, that I saw and felt an experience when I was a PhD student was that there were so many people who were desperate to get it right. There are so many people who were desperate to make change from within the institution. And so I don't mean to paint it as like, it really sucked and nobody was doing the work. Like everybody was doing the work. But what I found was that uh, there were a lot of important conversations happening in separate disconnected rooms. And, you know, I think what's really gotta happen is that there has to be an integration of approaches like it has to start from the top it's got to be pis willing to to have difficult conversations with themselves and with their peers about you know admissions requirements and are you are we are we recruiting heavily i mean one thing that i heard over and over when i was being recruited to phd programs i would ask advisors, like, why am I the only black person on this recruitment weekend? Like, why am I the only black person interviewing in this entire program? There are 60 people here. Why am I the only black person? And what I would hear, and I heard it at University of Michigan, and I heard it at Wisconsin, was, well, you know, they don't come here. It's cold. Black people don't want to come here. It's cold. We can't recruit them. And I heard it on the biochemistry recruitment weekend at Wisconsin, and I heard it at the genetics recruitment weekend at Wisconsin, that they they don't come here. I mean, like, what kind of acceptable thing is that to say to a student you want to attend your university? <laughs> um, something that I heard on a recruitment weekend was the person who was in charge of their admissions put his arm around my shoulder, brought me out of the, the sort of ending gala party and was like, you know, someone with your background is really gonna struggle here, but like, we want you to really come here anyway. And like, we're gonna bring you in over the summer and we're gonna work really hard to get you caught up to all your peers, but we really want people like you here. And I'm just like, I have a 4.0 GPA. Like, <laughs> I, I am an excellent <laughs> candidate for your university. I had like, I scored in the 99th percentile on the GRE. What do you mean people like me? I don't understand. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and so I think it starts with looking very deeply at the things that you're saying, like looking at the received notions and the passive assumptions you make about your student body, about the kind of people in your program, and thinking very hard about what kind of example it's setting for all those PhD students who are black and brown and queer who look at your faculty roster and there are no black faculty. It's like, how are they supposed to feel that they have a place in your, in your department? So I think we've got to start having these conversations in the open and we've got to make it, we've got to make people feel comfortable saying things like that because, you know, I went into my PhD program having already received like 16 racial accosts and I felt like I couldn't tell anybody because then I would be making trouble, you know? Mm -hmm. So if you don't have a free and open environment, I think, of course you're not going to fix anything. So I think it looks like having difficult conversations and getting comfortable 
being uncomfortable and making that an ethic within the department, within the institution, because you don't get change without discomfort. Um, and so that's, you know, one of my spiels is that we've gotta, we've gotta make people feel comfortable telling their stories because how else are you gonna know what to fix? You right. Know? right, and are you, are you hopeful on a personal level that that change can take place in kind of a, um, um, like an evolutionary fashion, like like more like cultural evolution, where you know we can kind of engender that change now, or do you think it'll be a more stark like generational change in 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 the academy? You know. Yeah. Well, well I mean, it's so. Hard. I mean, it's because it's because on one hand you look at like the cultural industries which seem to change and like on the pulse of culture though much delayed like you look at last summer where there was this vast turnover as cultural institutions were suddenly like ah oh, yes racism is bad we've always known it but now we're gonna really like do something about it and like that kind of thing gives me hope but then i look at science i'm like well science the thing about science is like if you say that something is racist all of the old white people who have tenure are like no it's not stop doing that we can fix this it's fine i voted for obama and so like i think i do think that it's going to be generational i think that i think it's going to take i think i think it's going to be very gradual until there is that sort of generational tipping point in science but i think science is going to lag behind so many of our other institutions just because of the way that it is structured. Like science is so hierarchical. Like it is so much about who your advisor was and who your advisor's advisor was and like who's giving grant dollars. And it is, I mean, it's so deeply entrenched that like it's hard to imagine it changing overnight in a, in a way that's similar to what we saw in the cultural industries last summer. But I mean, I, I'm a hopeful person, but having been through the crucible of academic science, I mean, <laughs> is it likely to take? Probably not. But would I like it to? Yes. Yeah, yeah. And I guess I guess even if even if it is the case that it's kind of generational, it doesn't it doesn't warrant putting off the conversation or kind yeah, of Yeah, like of course. <clears throat> um, so I want to get to another reader question. This is from Sophie Harrington. Um, she asked, do you think your training as a scientist, in particular the scientific method, shapes how you approach your writing process? Uh, I think so, probably. I, you know, I, and maybe it's not even the scientific method so much as um, in science was where I learned to think critically and how to sort of write critically and to, to sort of think very deeply. And so my whole critical thinking apparatus is constructed <laughs> <laughs> like by, like my advisor taught me how to think like that is just sort of true and and so my way of approaching mm -hmm. writing is whenever I sit down to write an essay I think about advice that my advisor gave me which is to sort of take the thing that you that you know in the deepest part of yourself to be most true and try to prove it wrong with ruthless intensity pursue skepticism you know um and and so that's how i write that's how i write fiction it's how i write nonfiction. and so you know in some sense like i learned more about writing in my phd program than i didn't well not in some sense in every sense 10 out of 10 i learned more about writing in my science program than i did in my than i did in my mfa um mm. and so yeah i mean science is I'm so indoctrinated that I could never not be a scientist now. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, would, I would think, and this, correct me if I'm wrong, but I would think that your powers of observation are one of the things that, that you know, there was a strong correlation between your scientific work and your writing work. Like looking at gametes of a nematode <laughs> um, is, is kind of akin to looking at the, the, the muscles of someone's neck yeah. Flex or the blood running through their ears, <laughs> you know? I mean, I think, and I think also it's like, as a scientist, you, you get so comfortable looking very closely at things for long periods of time. Like you are not afraid of being bored as a scientist and right. you learn to sort of excavate the thing that's under the thing you're looking at. Um, and I think the best writers have that too, that a level of curiosity and intense observation and scrutiny. I think those are two skills that serve you well in both science and in writing. So I think, yeah, I mean, I'm a trained scientist and I, I think in many ways I write like a scientist. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Um, great. Well, there's another reader question, again, anonymous, but this one's good. I like this. Um, this this reader, or this this audience member says, as I was reading the last few scenes of the book, I got really worried that something terrible was going to happen to Wallace, worse than what had already happened to him. I was wondering if you considered having something really terrible happen at the end, or if you never considered this. I really enjoyed the novel. Mm. Yeah, well, did I? It's funny, that's one of the first things my editor said to me was that he and another person in house that the publisher had read the book at the same time. And they came to di very different conclusions about the vibe of the last scenes of the novel. And it, one of them said, I thought something really awful was gonna happen. And then the other one was like, I thought it was really lovely and that it was ending on this very positive note. <laughs> and, and, and I mean, the truth is that I didn't know what was going to happen in the final scene. I mean, I knew what I wanted the last section of the book to be. I knew that I wanted sections one and 10 to be this kind of <clears throat> sliding doors, Rashomon, almost mirror like inversions of each other. Um, and so I knew that that was sort of the finish post of the book. But the, the the last thing to happen narratively in the book, I I mean, I didn't know what was going to happen when I sent those characters up to that roof. I had no clue. I had no clue what was going to happen. I didn't know what they were going to do. I didn't, I just didn't know. I just knew that they, I was just following the characters. And so I think part of what the reader feels in that moment is Wallace's own lack of certainty about what's going to happen when they go up to the roof or whatever. Like it's that feeling of uncertainty to me feels deeply important to understanding Wallace's experience as a person and that he is someone who who feels potentiated to violence, who feels great precarity. And I think what the reader is feeling there is that precarity of like, you don't know what's gonna happen to you when you go up there with this <laughs> this very large white man who, who could do violence <laughs> to you, who is admitted yeah. to being a violent person. <laughs> um, you don't know what's gonna happen to you. Um, and so it felt, you know, I felt it too when I was writing. I was like, who knows what's gonna happen? Maybe, maybe someone's gonna die. Maybe only one person comes down. <laughs> who knows what's gonna, what's gonna happen? Um, but it also felt important not to, not to look away from that moment. And it felt important not to, not to bail out just because I felt tense and uncertain. I felt really important to follow the characters into that moment and to let it be what it would be, you know, and <laughs> no spoilers. But I mean, I think it I think it ends up in a in an interesting place. But yeah, I'm right there with you. I had no clue. No clue. Yeah. <laughs> no idea. Interesting. Let me let me ask you another kind of literary question and it and it it involves some of the devices that you use throughout the book really. I think two I would almost call them characters birds mm. and the lake <laughs> and to me they almost functioned as the lake as this big mirror that kind of reflected the mood at times or reflected mm. the action in the story and then birds i think reflected wallace's own feelings where it kind of he had these little mi micro mirrors following him around can, can you just talk about those uh yeah. two, two that you used? I mean, it's interesting that I did, so I didn't know that there were that many birds in the book or that they were functioning as a motif until I saw the jacket copy of, saw the jacket of the book. And I was like, oh, right, there are a lot of birds in there. Whoa, oh my God, like what, talk about subliminal. Um, it was kind of amazing to, I was like, oh, right, there are a lot of birds. And I do think that Wallace is someone, you know, there's a, there's a part of the book where Wallace is thinking about birds and he's like, to be a bird, to be able to move and, and sort of all these dimensions to have absolute freedom <laughs> in three dimensional space. And he's like, I wonder what that would be like to be that free, um, to be that, to be able to choose your own context. And I do think that like birds, they don't have like one neat symbolic one-to-one -one, of course, but I do think that birds represent all sorts of things to Wallace, um, mainly agency and freedom and, and the ability to choose one's course and one's path. And I do think that the lake also represents this sort of boundless, scope and scale, the, the sort of murky uncertainty of life. And, you know, like it starts, the book starts with the lake being this, this sort of icky, algal, smelly object in the world of the novel. And then it ends with a sort of almost baptism where he sort of is willing to sort of go into it. And, you know, the, the lake in some ways functions, yes, as a, as a representative of Wallace's mood, but I think also with, as a manifestation of risk, as 
a, a, a call, like a, this thing that's calling him almost um, and threatening him and also promising him things. Um, and so they do, I, I agree, they sort of have a duality of risk and freedom and agency and precarity and um, and stuff like that. But also uh, like the lakes of Madison are so beautiful. I couldn't just like, I mean, I was like walking beside them every day to go to work and then walking by them every night coming home. and. The lake is such a presence in that city. It you you can feel it, you can smell it, and see it almost from almost every point of the city. And so, I don't know. It felt important to capture it. I, I really love that lake, and I you know sort of my love letter to the the danger and the beauty of Lake Mendota. <laughs> Um, all right. Well, I want to I want to be respectful of your time, but we have a lot of reader questions coming in, right. so I want to I want to give them an opportunity to, to be asked. So this one comes from Nadia Rakdawi. Hope I pronounced that right. Um, Nadia asks, "What made you decide to not be a, a scientist anymore and become a writer? Was there an event or events that happened that made you quit academia?" Well, I mean, very short answer, which is that someone was sabotaging my lab work and I didn't know it at the time and my thesis work was exploding. And so my thesis advisor, in thinking that she was motivating me, told me that I needed to uh, get very serious about my, my dissertation research or I might be asked to leave the lab. So that day I printed out my short stories and sent them to the Iowa Writers Workshop because I thought I needed a backup plan. Um, <laughs> But then my science started working really well. And then I got into Iowa and I had to make this choice. And the choice really came down to, could I live without writing or could I live without science? And the answer that I came to is that I could, it would be really painful and really difficult to give up science, but I could live without it, but I couldn't live up. I couldn't live without writing because writing was how I, I made sense of the world. And when science was going really difficult, writing was the thing that kept me sane in many ways. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I decided that I couldn't live without writing. And so I ultimately decided to give up science. So, you know, it's sort of a, I, I feel like it's one of those great moments in life. Not everybody has a moment where they have to choose, <laughs> you know, where they, where they are asked to choose between the, the thing that they would do with the rest of their lives. It, it was a difficult choice to have to make, but I think ultimately it's such a gift. Mm. Yeah. Um, so Mary Capuano asks, um, could you tell us some of the literary influences that shaped your writing alongside your scientific training and thought process? Uh, yeah. Were there books or films or any other particular pieces of art or media that you feel influenced your writing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, the short stories of the Canadian writer Mavis Gallant were really important to me um, because she's always writing about people in exile. Um, and I think also the, the novelist Andre Asimov, his work was important to me incredibly early on, um, because he was writing about queerness and desire. And it was like the first queer book I ever read was Call Me By Your Name. And, and I thought, oh, that means that lives like mine are worthy subjects of art. Um, and so those were, those were two of my earliest influences and they've been really formative ever since. Hmm. Great. Um, so here's another question from Sheker Mohan. Um, did you experience any negative repercussions from writing this book? The academic system is not perfect, but many students and trainees leave with negative experiences. Did I leave? I mean, not really. I mean, I wouldn't say that I had any negative experiences from writing the book. I mean, science was, at the time that I left, it was getting really my experience in science is getting very toxic. And so ultimately it's probably good that I left. But yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say that I, I wouldn't say that I left with any truly negative experiences like from writing this book. This book has brought me a lot of really positive experience. <laughs> I feel like it's, it's been pretty good and I'm still on really good terms with my lab mates and, and they know it's a work of fiction and they know it's about one person's subjective experience. So it's been, it's been very pleasant. Yeah. Um, so this might be a good kind of uh, <laughs> final question. Again, we want to be respectful of your time. We appreciate you joining us so much. It's been such a nice conversation. Um, Calvert Morgan asks, uh, now that you've captured so much about the scientific community, where will you point your microscope next? <laughs> what, are you, uh, what are you looking forward to exploring in your next books? Oh, that is so funny. That is my editor. Hi, Cal. Um, Hi, Cal. <laughs> 
Yeah, so my next book is a short story collection called Filthy Animals, and it's a linked short story collection that follows a young man um, who has just gotten out of a mental hospital, um, and he falls in with these dancers. Um, and and the book, I think, is very much interested in similar themes of alienation and isolation, but instead of being set within a science lab, a lot of the stories have to do with dancers and art and artistry. And my next few books, I think, almost all about art and artists and capitalism and cultural institutions and that sort of thing. Yeah, do you think that you'll ever return? You, you, you mentioned the fact that you're, you're kind of, you're a scientist in the way that you mm -hmm. think you'll ever return to writing about aspects of the scientific enterprise or the experience of scientists? Maybe so. I mean, I think that I, you know, I wrote I wrote as much about it as I could at the time, and I'm I'm off exploring other things now. But I I mean I don't see why not. I mean I sometimes still think, what is Wallace up to? Like, what is he, <laughs> what is he doing? And I know that I, by nature, am a clingy writer and reader. I don't like letting go of characters, which is why I'm always writing linked stories. And so you know, I wouldn't say that we've said goodbye to those characters forever, but at least for now. Uh, you heard it here first. There's a potential real life too. People coming. Realer life, yeah. Realer life. <laughs> all right. Well, I think that's all we have the time for um, now. Again, we really appreciate you joining us, Brandon. Um, so, if if audience members have any further questions, please consider reaching out to Brandon directly. We provide, uh, I think, a link to his Twitter feed um, in the in the documentation we'll be sending you. Um, as a reminder, the webinar will be archived on the Scientist website and you will receive an email notifying you when the on-demand webinar is available so you can rewatch it as many times as you like. Um, please also feel free to comment on the Social Club Facebook group and tell us what you liked and perhaps didn't like so much about this particular uh, event. Um, so I'd like to thank everyone who took the time to join us today. We got some great questions um, and comments. Um, on behalf of the Scientists, I'd also like to thank Brandon again for joining us. Our next book club will be on August 20th, when we'll be discussing Pipe Dreams, The Urgent Global Quest to Transform the Toilet by Chelsea Wald, who will be joining us for the event. So it's a it's a departure for us. It's the first time we're discussing a nonfiction book. Um, so that, that should be interesting. Mm. Chelsea's book takes readers on a humorous and informative journey through what it takes to engineer sanitation systems around the world, along with all the positive changes revamping the toilet can bring, including minimizing inequalities, mitigating climate change and water scarcity, improving agriculture and optimizing health. So again, I'd like to thank you all for tuning in. Um, and I'd like to thank Brandon again for joining us. It was a, a great conversation. Um, everyone enjoy your weekend and uh, keep an eye out for more news from the scientists on our Facebook page, on our, on our website and other places. Yeah, thanks everybody. Bye. Take care. Have a good weekend. Bye, you too.